Thanks for coming to this session this afternoon. So my name is Rufus Isaacs. I'm an entomologist at Michigan State University in East Lansing. And I'll be talking to you about the wild bees of Michigan. Before I get started, I really wanted to acknowledge my co-author on this, Jason Gibbs. He's actually out of the country today, so I got the job of giving this presentation, but he should really be doing it. Most of this is his work, um, his photographs, his data, and so um, hopefully I'll do a good job of presenting it to you here today. So my goal today is to try and uh, cover these topics. So that's Jason on the left there, so you know what he looks like if you see a guy out in a blueberry field in April or May, uh, swinging his net like that, you'll, you can be pretty sure it's Jason. He's, he's uh, collecting, collecting bees actually all through the year, um, has done a lot to add to our knowledge of the wild bees of Michigan, so that's what I'm going to cover during the presentation. Uh, but yeah, I think, um, I think a lot of what I'll be sharing with you is, is good new information that uh, Jason's been able to put together, and these slides um, are ones that he developed. So a well, little introduction. I want to talk about an effort that we're doing at Michigan State to develop a bee checklist for Michigan. There isn't actually currently a, a statewide list that we can refer back to to say what bees are here and, and to help guide people in their identification of, of wild bees. And there's a lot, of, lot more interest in pollinators and wild pollinators. So this we hope will be useful for many years to come. So I'll describe the effort there and then go through uh, the types of wild bees that you might find in Michigan and talk about that diversity that you're seeing in those boxes as they uh, work their way around the auditorium. And we've divided it up into three main groups just for some structure. So spring, summer are two distinct periods when there are bees that just come out during those times of the year. And then we'll talk about some all-season bees that you could find any time of the year um, during the growing season. And then the group that we'll call the wannabes. So these are in some of those boxes that are going around the, the insects that would like you to think that there are bees so that you leave them alone, but they're actually not. And I'm sure this audience is pretty well familiar with those, but we'll touch on those as well. And then at the end, I've got a few further reading opportunities for you if you're interested. All right, so I can't really give a talk to this audience especially um, or to talk about the wild bees of Michigan without mentioning honeybees. We used to have a lot more wild colonies of honeybees in the state, but with varroa mite, um, numbers of those have declined. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time focused on honeybees, because I think you probably all know about them already, and you've heard lots of other presentations here at the meeting about them. But those are obviously one of the species that could be out in the wild. I want to spend most of my time today focusing on the great diversity of wild bees. And this photograph, this pair of photographs here shows uh, the incredible range of sizes that wild bees can be. We've got one there that's probably just a two or three millimeters long to um, a huge one there. I think that's Megachile Pluto, um, one of the largest uh, wild bees, not found in Michigan, I don't think, but, um, but still a very large bee. So we've got this great diversity of size. We're going to talk about diversity of life cycles, of nesting biology. Uh, we'll see all that diversity on display as we go through the presentation here this afternoon. One reason for doing this checklist that I just mentioned is that we know relatively little about the native bee fauna of Michigan. There have been some surveys that have been done over the years. Each of those was somewhat distinct and Jason's efforts are to bring those together. And then there have been some studies recently of the um, distribution of some of the bees of concern. The, these two graphics here are from surveys of bumblebees across the eastern side of the United States. And you can see that there's been relatively limited collection effort in Michigan. Um, and we'd like to redress that as well and also just make sure that people understand what bees we have here and, and their abundance and diversity. So what Jason's been doing for the last couple of years is, first of all, looking through the literature. There's some reports that have come from different people, some um, collection trips that are very focused in area, others that were across the state some that were focused up in the Upper Peninsula. So he's been digging through the old literature and pulling that together. Um, going through some databases, there are online databases or private ones that, that he can access where you can search for bees collected in Michigan and, and get those records. He's also been going through the various uh, museums. So this, I think, is a photograph of the U of M's collection down in Ann Arbor. Um, but we also have a collection at 
at MSU, and there are other private collections that he's been able to, um, to get access to. And then the fourth one on the list, as I showed in that photograph, is him going out and swinging a net. And it's, amazing, it's been amazing to see what happens when you have somebody that really knows their bees come here and spend dedicated time focusing on this, because even outside our building where we work, there's a nice set of horticultural demonstration gardens on MSU's campus, and he's literally walked outside our building during a lunch break and found a new species record for Michigan that was presumably there all the time, we just didn't, we just didn't know it. So that's been great to have him uh, doing that, that work and understanding what we have here in Michigan. So he's found 33 so far new state records for the state. A couple of examples are, are pictured here. One is this uh, Dionomia, sunflower special. It's actually a pretty large bee, so it's a wonder that it wasn't recorded previously, but that's one there. And then this exotic leafcutter bee, which is a specialist on star thistle. And um, this is work that he's working, working towards publication on. Across all the records that he's compiled, he's been able to put this together into a really big spreadsheet and then look at what we know about the relative um, abundance of bees that have certain nesting sites and certain nesting biology. So far, Jason's up to about 450 species of wild bees in Michigan. And I'm expecting that number will rise a little bit as this work continues. But um, 450 species is a pretty, pretty uh, diverse community. Most of them are, are soil nesters, and that actually lines up with what we know about wild bees in general. Most species of wild bees nest in the ground. They are digging or uh, excavating nests or using nests, nest holes that were already there. And then most of them are solitary, which means that they're not forming a colony like a honeybee. They're, um, it's an individual female that collects nectar and pollen, takes that back to her nest, and then lays an egg on that. And that egg develops as a, into a larva, feeds on the nectar and pollen, and then probably next year or maybe later in the season will emerge as an adult. But that mother often, well, usually doesn't ever meet her offspring. She, she finishes egg laying and dies, and then those larvae will develop later. So most of these bees, as it says, are, are nesting in the ground and they're solitary, a little bit different from the honeybees. So this is a comparison to other states. We're not bragging too much here, but um, we are a little bit higher or, or in similar numbers than um, surrounding states in terms of species diversity. And there's some other uh, nearby states that have done similar efforts and we, we can compare our list with theirs and see if we have any unique species that weren't recorded in those other, in those other states. One thing that's apparent as, as Jason's mapped this information is that the there's, is that there's diversity across the state, but it's clustered, or at least our knowledge of it is clustered. So you might look at this map and think, well, what is it about southwest Michigan that this, there is this great hotspot of bee diversity? Well, it's mostly because that's where we've done a lot of our studies. So this is really a reflection of effort more than diversity. And if you think about it in that sense, it means that there's probably a lot more to learn. There's a lot of counties there that are rather light in their color, which probably doesn't mean that they're poor for bees, it probably just means that we haven't looked so much. So for a taxonomist like Jason, that's great. That's a great opportunity to uh, go out and continue the search and see what else we can find. Um, so you might be interested in, in why those counties. So I mentioned Southwest Michigan is where a lot of the fruit and vegetable research has been done, and so we found, look, looked for bees a lot more there. Um, Kalamazoo County is highlighted there. That's, um, if I can get the mouse going. So that's where Kellogg Biological Station is. So there's been a lot of collections uh, here. This is where uh, MSU is in Ingham County. Uh, University of Michigan's over here. And then this, this little hotspot here is um, a, a gentleman that worked for Dow Chemical and was an amateur entomologist and did bee collections through much of his life and then actually um, donated this bee collection to, the to Michigan State University. And so we have this hot spot of knowledge around Midland County for, uh, for bee diversity there. And then in the Upper Peninsula, there was a, a program for a number of years to look at the effect of uh, sonar that the Navy was developing on the ecology. And they were interested in all kinds of different kinds of ecology. So they looked at the plants and the animals, and they included bees. And so we actually know quite a bit about the bee community up in the Upper Peninsula there. Um, 
so yeah, I think this graph shows the same kind of thing, number of species on the left and some of those counties. But as I mentioned earlier, all those green ones at the bottom that are less than 50 bees, those are counties that we could probably find a lot more about if we just went and sampled them. One thing that you also realize as you start looking at these data is that there are counties that are, in this case, fairly close to each other, Ingham and Livingston County. They both have about the same number of bee species, but there's actually only 140 of those 200 and something that are overlapping. So you can use some calculations from those comparisons to estimate what there probably is there if we do the effort to um, sample really thoroughly. And, and then the, uh, the numbers would be up to this sort of 400 level on a county, uh, county by county basis. Regionally, looking around the state, Jason's break this, broken this up by um, region, so that's northern lower peninsula, northwest, southern lower peninsula, southwest, and upper peninsula. And again, I think this probably reflects where we've put most of our effort more than actual bee diversity. But there's a lot, I guess, just highlight the point that there's still a lot to learn. So in the collection effort that, that has been underway, in addition to learning how many species there are and what species there are in these different regions of the state, we are also finding some, some new information about a particular species. So this one, Megachile mucida, so one of the, um, one of the spring bees that's like a, an osmia or like a, like a uh, leafcutter bee. This one is a leafcutter bee. Uh, it's actually a new state record. Jason was also able to track it back to its nest, uh, which is a lot harder than it sounds, and tracking a bee back to exactly where it's coming out of the ground can be challenging, but he, he was able to excavate the nest and, and got some information on not only where it nests, how deep it, it nests, what it's using for nesting material, and then also I'm going to talk a little bit more later in the presentation about these kleptoparasites. So these are bees that live on bees, sort of the dark underbelly of the bee world. They're all, you know, they're great and they do pollination and all of that, but there's also some bees that avoid uh, the hard work of collecting pollen from flowers and they go and feed on other bees. And so um, Jason's now also got a record of a, of a species interaction there between two bees, one being the parasite of this Megachile species. Uh, another example of a new, um, new set of information is from this Lasioglossum species, which nests in, um, in wood, in rotting wood. And this is out, I think this was collected out in one of the uh, areas of, of uh, like forest remnants on the MSU campus. So again, not too far from our building. And he excavated these nests out of this log, chased, tracked the bee back to where it was coming from, and uh, was able to find out more about the larvae and the, the, the pollen. You can actually see there, this is, these, these are developing larvae in their individual cells. Uh, which are close to finishing development. You can just see a little bit of pollen is left on the edge of this one. And then here's a new, um, a new pollen ball that's been brought back, and that little white thing there is the uh, egg or the young developing larva feeding on that pollen. So this is all happening within a, an old rotten log. So this is Jason's slide, which is a plea to the audience. If um, if any of you have collections or observations of nest aggregations of bees, uh, especially if you're in these undersampled counties here, he would love to hear from you. That's his email address. And you can email him and report what you're seeing. And if, it's, uh, if, it's, um, if he's able to, he'll, he'd love to come out and do collections and try and find out if that's a, a new record for that county. OK, so I'm going to spend, like I mentioned at the beginning, a little, little time going through uh, the different kinds of bees and their, their biologies of the species that we're finding here in Michigan. And there are, here you can see the six bee families that we find within the state. So the image on the right there is, is some taxonomy that shows how, how these bees are related from a recent publication out of a, a lab at Cornell. Um, but you can see some examples there of names of bees that you might have heard of, minor bees that, that uh, dig down in the soil. The APD are the group that the honeybees are within, also bumblebees and the carpenter bees. And then this very special is squash bee that pollinates uh, cucurbits. There are the colleted bees, which are cellophane bees, so named because they, they use cellophane to waterproof their cells underground. Um, we just saw one of the helictid sweat bees, 
The mega chylids collect either um, soil particles or leaf particles or leaf, leaf pieces. And then there's not so many of them, but then these melitidae, the oil collecting bees, there are a few of those recorded in the state. And you can see the numbers by family here. So um, Jason, in his taxonomic work, is more focused on this group, the most diverse group, the Halictidae in the, in the right of the graph. And that's a particularly diverse group and also a particularly challenging group to uh, do identifications of. Okay, so here's how I'm going to go through. I'm going to talk, I think the order is that we'll talk about spring bees and then summer bees, and then we'll wrap up with some all-season bees before the end. All right, so before we took, get to the actual bees, I, I said I'd talk a little bit about the wannabes. These are the ones that get uh, mistaken from, for bees, and in those boxes that went around, you'll have seen some specimens. So there's some flies that would really like you to think that they're a bee, so that they, they color, colorful, they're very colorful, and they look almost like a bumblebee, except the head is the wrong shape, and as flies, they only have two wings, so there's some, some things, if you look close, that you could tell. Um, the bomboleids, these bee flies, are, they have the big fly um, eyes, and they don't have the long antennae. They just have the little sort of uh, pokey antennae at the front. And again, they just have two wings, but they're trying to convince you that they're a bee. And then the hoverflies at the bottom there, those are often striped black and yellow, and people mi mistake those for bees. Sometimes we'll, we'll even have folks confused between beetles and bees. Uh, wasps are obviously um, often confused, and, and we get a lot of calls at the university in an extension. We get lots of calls for uh, removing bees from people's houses, but it's actually a wasp nest that's built up in there, and that's often a point of confusion. And then sometimes these moths, these big hummingbird moths that um, are not bees either, but um, people, people get them confused. So those are the not bees, and let's spend some time thinking about, um, think back to the spring and the last couple of months. These would have been the bees that would be active, miners, cellophane, and uh, mason bees, and there's some examples of them there on the bottom. These are great pollinators for many of the crops that are produced in Michigan, and so uh, they've ad adapted their behavior and in some cases their morphology to be able to access those flowers and are very efficient at moving pollen from flower to flower. These minor bees, the Andrina species, are ground nesters. That's one on a, on a strawberry flower. But these adults will live for maybe a month and a half or so. They'll do all their collection of pollen and nectar, um, put them in these individual balls, lay an individual egg on there, and then that adult bee will die, and those larvae will develop in the soil through the summer and will be close to ready to emerge by the winter time, but then they'll spend the winter underground and then we'll be ready to emerge in the springtime for when those flowers come out. So here's what you might see. You might see a, a bee pictured here at the bottom. You might see it buzzing low across the ground, and then they'll settle down on a place where the soil is the right uh, texture and density, and they'll start digging down themselves. There's one just you can see with the, the thorax, uh, or with the abdomen sticking out of the ground, and they, they have adaptations on the forelegs to, uh, to do really good digging, and then pretty soon they're disappeared and they're down in the ground uh, excavating that, that nest out. And once that is ne nest is excavated, they'll, they'll keep adding new chambers to add new, um, new pollen balls and, and put the new eggs in there. There are also some cuckoo bees of the, the uh, soil nesting bees that I just described. And if you know about cuckoos that are birds, you probably know the story there where they, they go in and they'll push the, the actual birds that made the nest, they'll push their eggs out and lay, um, lay their own, and thereby trick that bird into bringing back all the food. It's a similar kind of situation here where this bee will go down in the hole, they'll be able to find that little hole, go down in there, lay their egg on that pollen ball, and then their egg will hatch maybe a little bit quicker, and their larvae are usually quite aggressive, and they'll kill that other larva and now they've got a nice ball of food that they'll be able to feed on uh, and develop as a larva. So they don't collect pollen from flowers. They're not providing any pollination service. They're just, um, they're just um, making the most of the resource that that other bee has collected. 
So these can be visible in nesting areas. We, I mentioned I work in blueberry farms sometimes, and at the edge of the blueberry field, you might see an open area of sandy soil with some little holes in it. And you might see these rather uh, colorful, and often red or yellow and black, um, sort of flying low across the ground, and they're looking for those nests. And that can be an indication that you have a healthy population of these soil, other soil nesting bees whose nests they're um, uh, st basically stealing the resources from. The cellophane bees, we have a few, of, few species of these um, in, in Michigan as well. These are also solitary nesting in the ground. And the photograph here on the right um, shows some of those uh, nest cells that have been excavated. And you kind of see there that cellophane covering that they use to waterproof the outside of the nest. And that's their, the yellow is their pollen resource that's inside there with the egg on it. And one of the species that we have been looking at quite intently is this, uh, this Caletes species here that is a blueberry pollinator. We found that up in the Muskegon, um, Muskegon County, north of Holland area um, as one of, the, one of the bees that's contributing to blueberry pollination in the spring. So some other spring bees are these Osmia species. These are termed mason bees because they will bring back soil. They're bringing back uh, soil particles. And they're using that soil as a uh, structure for their nest where they actually will use it to separate the cells here. So you can see some soil here. Each, one, each of these divisions was many, many flights back and forth by that bee to collect individual grains of soil. And they gradually stick it together. And this is one, the yellow there is one group of pollen with nectar. And there's a little larva developing there. Then they seal it, and then they'll do the next one, and then they'll do the next one, and then they'll do the next one until that tube that they found is full. You can actually exploit this, and it is exploited commercially, where people will put out straws or bamboo shoots uh, cut up, and you can have those filled up with, um, with these bees. There's certain preferred diameters, certain preferred materials, but um, there's a whole industry, especially in the West Coast. This is a photograph on the bottom left from almonds where there's commercial production of these bees as either an alternative or a, or a um, complement to honeybees. And they raise such huge numbers that this is, these are actually like, I think they're either pizza boxes or USPS boxes where they've got individual um, or a box with maybe hundreds of those cells in there that they hold through the winter. And then when they get just about to the point of almond bloom, They'll um, cut some holes in these, put them out in the orchards, and the bees will literally come boiling out of there. And these bees are very good pollinators of those um, spring apple, almond, cherry crops. There's two species that are being used more for pollination. One is the, the top one there is the Japanese orchard bee, not native to Michigan, but Japanese orchard bee. And we have that pretty much throughout the state. That's being used in cherry orchards and apple orchards in Michigan. And then Osmia lignaria is our native species. And that's the one that you can see boiling out of those pizza boxes. And both of them can be manipulated with these commercially available um, wooden containers, like you can see there, where you make, a, you make a hole of the right diameter, and they'll find it and start using it as a home. So going to, um, to the summer bees, the, the bees that are going to come out this time of the year, we're now seeing some leaf cutters, some of these longhorn bees that pollinate um, pumpkin and crops like that. The wool carter bees that will actually gather, um, they gather like the hairs off lamb's ears and plants like that and use that in their nesting. So we'll go through a few of these here in the next few slides. So the megachylidae, which include those osmia that I just talked about, megachylid basically means big jaws. And so um, they're using those big jaws to cut Leaf material you might see in your garden, um, roses, or I, in my garden I see red bud that has these beautifully circular cut um, pieces out of the leaves. And that's these bees collecting those individual pieces and then carrying them back to make their nesting material. So some of them nest in the ground, some nest in these cavities. Um, you can see that bee in the top right that has a very yellow abdomen, and that's where they pack the pollen. Instead of using like a honeybee does, instead of using the, the hind legs and the scoper, they're actually putting that all on the, um, all the corbiculae. They're actually using that, um, that abdomen. It's got hairs on it, and they pack the pollen there and then scrape it off when they get back to their nest. So here's an example of one. 
I think, I didn't get a chance to ask Jason before he left, but I think that might be this, um, this Megachile sculpturalis, which is an invasive species that's come into Michigan and it was introduced in the Carolinas and has gradually moved its way through, moving its way through the country. And this one, you'll notice it if you get this in your, uh, in your garden or uh, wherever you're trying to build these bees up because it, it's active usually in the later part of July and into August but it is very large and it uses resin from plants to plug up its nest hole. So you get a really like uh, shiny resin um, seal on the, end of these, on the end of these nests. So there's wool carter bees I mentioned. Um, there's a couple of species here. They're European and they're interesting in that they'll actually defend a patch of flowers. So if you have a good nice patch of flowers in a garden, you might see a, a very fast moving um, bee sort of, they're, kind of squat and tough looking um, black and yellow bees and they'll, they'll sit there and then if another bee comes in they'll zoom out and try and push them away or they'll actually attack them in some cases and um, try and defend that territory. They use the, the wool, it's not really wool but it's, it's cut off um, leaf trichomes, they'll use that in their nest material so that photograph at the bottom there in, in white with the white there is actually what they pack their nest with so interesting an interesting bee and um, a little different on the, on the biology compared to some of the others. There are some resin bees that will use um, plant resins. If you just heard the last uh, presentation, that was, that was all about resins for honeybees, but they're using similar material from plants to, um, to make their nests and packing that together, mashing the, the, um, the resins together with plant material or soil material to make a really strong structure. Okay, so longhorned bees, as you can see in the photograph at the top right, these, they don't necessarily have horns, but they have very long antennae. And so they're um, distinguished by that, and mostly they're fairly focused on particular kind of plants. So they're called oligolectic in that they go to a specific group of plants, maybe within a genus. And the males here have the long antennae, and they're mostly on asteraceae, so those, um, things like New England Aster that we, we will get later in the summer. Here's a collection of some of the nice photographs that Jason's been able to take of these, um, this group. The one on the bottom left there, I love, I love the look of that one because it's, and you can see it in, in probably all of these, but they have really hairy legs. So it almost looks like when, they're, when they've collected a lot of pollen, it's kind of like a little Cheeto flying through the air because they're so loaded down with pollen uh, to take that back to their nest to, to to make a pollen ball. So squash bees, um, this is a couple of photographs of squash bees. They're an important pollinator, our, our, our most impo important pollinator for, in terms of native bees anyway, for the, the squash. And also Michigan is a large producer of pickling cucumbers. So they'll visit those flowers. Um, they have these really long, hor not horns, but the antennae again, and they're active really early in the morning. So these can be missed if you don't get to, your, to a field to look out for them until eight o'clock in the morning, they've already done their work. Um, I have a community garden plot on Martin Luther King Boulevard in Lansing. And um, if I get there, I have to get there sort of five o'clock in the morning when it's just getting light in the, in the later part of the summer when these crops are in bloom and that's when they'll be active. So they do all their work and then they're back in their nest in the soil for the rest of the day. Okay, and drenids, um, there are a number of these that are active during the summer. We'll see them on goldenrod later in the year, some specialists that, that really like that plant. And they also have the kleptoparasites, the, the, the parasites of bees that will come in and uh, use, use the nest as a source of, of food. Those cellophane bees, there's some of those that are active through the summer, and in particular these hyleus, the masked bees. So they can easily be confused with wasps because they don't have a lot of the hairs that you typically associate, fuzzy hairs that you typically associate with a bee. But those are cavity nesters, and um, they actually have an internal crop, so they actually hold the pollen internally inside their body and then regurgitate that as, as uh, food for their, for their offspring. And there are also some cuckoo bees for this group. So just like the ones we talked about earlier, and Jason likes to highlight one identification feature here is that they have a smiley face. So on the, um, if you look at this part of the, the thorax here, we've got that, that uh, 
combination of patterns that kind of looks like a smiley face on the, on the body. Okay, and then um, sweat bees, a couple of examples here. Some are new records for Michigan. These are um, the group that Jason is particularly interested in, and so there's a photograph of him there rowing out into some isolated spot in the middle of a lake to get, um, to get the specimens. But you can see a list of those, um, of those species that have been collected, including some speci specimens that were collected from Isle Royale, so one of the real furthest north collection spots that we have for the database of Michigan bees. And once you start getting up there, you're almost up into some of the Canadian um, ecotones, different, different plant communities and different bees that we'll, we're finding up there. All right, and then this is one of those, um, one of those species that we showed earlier, one of the giant um, sweat bees. So almost, almost bumblebee size, but it's more closely related to some of those smaller sweat bees that you'll see on your skin because they're going for the salts in your sweat during the summertime. Another sweat bee is this, um, this species that Jason found. He was actually looking for it because he knew that there was um, a specialist bee on um, Enothera, which is evening primrose. And so there was a patch of, patch of flowers on his, I think on his cycle home. And so he kept looking for it and eventually found this, uh, which is a new record for Michigan, this specialist on on um, evening primrose that comes out just as the light is coming up or going down um, during the day. And then interestingly, this, um, this one is actually an oil collecting bee. We don't have too many of those. If you remember, there were just a couple of those species here in Michigan, but um, he's been able to find this in, in uh, Michigan feeding on yellow loosestrife or visiting yellow loosestrife. And we've got to go back almost 70 years until he could find a previous record of that. Um, it recorded in the state. Okay, so um, I'm going to switch now from the summer bees to those that are active through the whole summer. And of course, one of those that you are all very aware of is the honeybee. And uh, Jason includes in this presentation a great old photograph from 1950, if you can't read the small text at the bottom. This is his father's family bee yard in uh, Ontario, Canada. And so he's come from a, from a family of, uh, of beekeepers and Obviously, that's where his love of bees started. So honeybees will be one species that are here through the summer. And like I said at the beginning, I probably don't need to tell this audience too much about how honeybees work and the fact that they are active through the summer. So we're going to switch to some of the others that are in this category. We've got the bumblebees that are um, a group that a lot of people are familiar with, social cavity nesting bees. There are some solitary ground nesters that are in the sweat bee group that Jason studies, and then also some carpenter bees. And those can be boring into, um, into wood and into stems to make a nest. So let's start with bumblebees. This is a group people are really interested in because there's stories in the news and research going on showing that there's declines in their range and that they're under threat from diseases and uh, um, climate change and uh, loss of habitat. They can also be purchased. There's actually a company in Michigan that, um, that produces these and you can order a box of Bombus impatiens, one of the native species. So I'm going to focus just on the, on the native ones that you might, or the, the wild ones that you would find out in Michigan. And their life cycle is uh, depicted here where during the summertime where we are now, they would be uh, in the colony development phase and trying to build up that colony as large as they can before the weather starts turning later in the year. As the day length starts changing, they'll start um, producing um, new queens and males that mate during the later part of the summer. And then the mated females look for protected places to spend the winter, usually down in an old rodent burrow. They nest in compost heaps. They'll nest in old mattresses, anything that they can find that seems like a nice protected place for the winter. And different species will find different nesting sites. And then in the spring, that mated queen emerges, and she looks for um, a new place. She goes and visits some of those earliest spring flowers and looks for places to set up a new colony of her own and then the, the cycle starts again. So she'll, she'll start by visiting flowers herself and building those first, um, those first cells, as you see in the top left of the slide there. And then once there's enough workers started up, she'll stay home and kind of like a honeybee queen will stay there and lay eggs and have the work done by the rest of the colony. 
and those workers will be going out and collecting the resources and bringing them back to the, to the nest. We have a number of species of bumblebees in Michigan. Um, some of them are depicted here, but mostly the, the sort of coarse level of identification you can use is the banding pattern on the, uh, on the abdomen. And there are some nice guides online for um, how you can compare those different banding patterns to determine which species you have. Um, I was actually in my garden this morning before I came down to this meeting, and, and even at 7.30 this morning, nice warm uh, summer morning, there were three or four species buzzing around on the, on the wildflowers in the front garden. So you can get quite a bit of diversity just locally in an urban landscape from the number of bumblebees that can find their way to uh, find places to live in our, in our gardens. This is one, however, that has been a species of interest because the range is declining rapidly across the eastern U.S. There's a report from Husband in the 1980s that shows places where it was collected around Michigan, um, but it hasn't actually been officially reported in the state since 1999. So if any of you are out looking and you see a bee with these two little patches of um, orange around the yellow part on the abdomen there, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, there are some areas that it's still reported in some surrounding um, states, but this might also be part of the, what I mentioned earlier, where with more sampling effort, we may be able to find some, some remnant populations of this. There are certainly some areas of Michigan that you would think hadn't been developed too much um, in recent years. Okay, carpenter bees. There's a giant carpenter bee, this Xylocopa virginica. This is the one that bores into people's, um, you know, into your deck or your outside porch or your shed, and you'll find perfectly round holes, and it's actually chewed those with its own mouth parts and chewed its way into the, the wood. And then a really closely related species, which is hard to imagine because they're so different in size and somewhat in their biology, is this dwarf carpenter bee in the bottom left here. And this, um, this species is fairly widely distributed across Michigan. They tend to make their nests down in little uh, stems like a like an old blackberry stem or raspberry stem, you'll see them boring down in there. I've even done carpentry on the outside of my house, and I was on top of a 30-foot ladder pulling old windows um, off, and the, the old screw holes, as I was up on the top of this ladder, there's serotina bees trying to get in there to check it out as a potential nesting site. So they're pretty, pretty opportunistic, um, but they're also just a couple of millimeters long, and they can fit into these tiny, uh, tiny potential nest spots. So Jason's love um, is the Holictids, and there's uh, 118 species that have been reported. That's from Michigan. And um, actually, I think that might be, yeah, that, that, that's from Michigan, the 118 species. And, and this is the really diverse group that have some that are solitary and strictly solitary with individual females um, provisioning individual nests, others that are communal where they'll be together in an area of suitable uh, nesting, and then some that actually have a, a, a really simple version of the caste system like you have in honeybees where there might be a dominant uh, female that will be doing more of the, the work in the nest and then others that will be sent out to collect the resources. These tend to be the most collected wild bees, which is why currently with a lot of people doing studies on bee, wild bee ecology, we end up getting a lot of boxes sent to our lab that say Jason Gibbs uh, MSU, and he's being um, used as an expert by people studying these bees so that they can get the identifications of their rather complicated to identify bees um, from Jason's expertise. So, um, yeah, so they tend, they tend to be, when you do broad surveys of wild bees, they tend to be the ones that are most, most abundant. Some examples here are, are of... of um, of sweat bees that do the cuckoo behavior that we talked about earlier, the sphicodes. And these tend to go on other sweat bees, so there are cuckoos of the sweat bees as well as the andrina and the others that I spoke about earlier. But this is an area that we really don't know a whole lot about. Jason's interested in doing some more work on these um, to understand more about their biology and their, their ecology. As he studied sweat bees in Michigan, he's also been able to find some nesting information about these and a couple of photographs, first of all, at the soil level. So you can imagine why it might be hard to study nesting biology of these bees because finding something that looks like this is probably gonna be pretty hard. It's a pretty indistinct entrance 
um, to, a, to a nest. But then what he's been able to do is, if he finds something that he suspects might be a nest, um, it's very simple. You just put a little plastic container over there, and eventually, if a bee is in there, it's going to come out, and you can figure out what species was in that hole, and then start excavating. And so he's been able to very carefully excavate out these, um, these nests, and the photographs here depict the, the pollen bowl here, first sign of the pollen bowl. Going a little further in, you see the, the egg there that's recently been laid on that pollen bowl. And then he was actually able to find, um, at one point, the, I don't know if it's the only bee that was in that nest, but one of the sweat bees down in the nest with the pollen bowl and the, and the egg. So probably a very confused bee that why it's suddenly daylight and why the nest has suddenly got this guy with a camera uh, staring at it. So if you, um, if you come back later in the year, you'll find these larvae that are developing and uh, they pupate, very similar to how a honeybee larva would look in general form. And then eventually that pupa is going to emerge as another sweat bee adult to fly around and find resources. So in summary, just to wrap this up, um, I think you've seen now in today's presentation that we have a great diversity of wild bee species in Michigan. Uh, we're up to about 450. The number changes, um, fluctuates around that depending on whether taxonomists are lumping species together or splitting them apart. But we're hoping um, this winter that we'll have some final form of this list that can be shared and posted online. Jason's also getting some really good quality close-up photographs of all these bees that we have in the collection. And so we'll then be able to give people you know, resources that they can use to help identify their own bees. By doing this work, we're getting some great information on distribution and biology, but if anybody here wants to help us and has collections of their own or observations, we're, as I said, we're really interested in getting input from people on what you've been able to find in other parts of the state. And we're hoping that in the long term, we'll have um, a much better understanding of the bees that we share this state with and learn about their ecology and how they fit into the overall ecosystem of the different habitats here in, in the state of Michigan. My last couple of slides um, are to just let you know that since I work at MSU in the last six months or so, we've set up this um, organization called the Michigan Pollinator Initiative. And it's really just a, um, an effort to try and bring together the various parts of the university that are working on pollinators. So bees is part of it and the, probably the largest part of it. But we also have a few folks that are interested in monarch butterflies. Um, and Megan Milbrath, who you might be familiar with, she's, she's uh, here in Michigan and is now working at MSU with us to coordinate this, is bringing together the kind of work that I've just talked about today. Um, Walter Pett, who does the apiculture extension, Zachary Wang, who does the apiculture research, and the other people that are involved in pollination research in various different crop systems. Um, so you can see the focus areas there. Um, this is getting going. There's a website that's starting, and, and hopefully you'll get to learn more about this as our programs develop in the next few years. I promise you a little bit of further reading if you're interested in this. The, the sort of Bible of this um, topic is the book by Michener, which is The Bees of the World. So that's a good entryway into the great diversity of bees around the world. I don't think he has all 225 uh, said all 25,000 species um, listed in here, but there's a great amount of good information in there about, um, about bee biology and, and taxonomy. If you're interested in raising some of those, I talked a little bit about those um, blue orchard bees and that kind of bee that is active in the springtime that you can build up the numbers of in, in, uh, in the right sized um, tubes or cavities. So this book that was put together by Marla Spivak from University of Minnesota and some folks from the Xerces Society called Managing Alternative Pollinators, the whole thing is online for free. So if you go to the SARE website, you can actually get the PDF and that will tell you all the, all the management options that you need to think about for doing that. And then the Xerces Society has this book that's come out um, about attracting native pollinators and that's got a great uh, set of photographs and not just about the bees but also the habitat and how to set that up for bees in your particular setting, whether it's a garden or a farm or a park. Um, so I guess that just leaves me to wrap up with a, with a slide that opens it up for questions. And if there's any time, we'll uh, see what folks are interested in in the audience. Thanks a lot.
So, any questions? Yes, sir. Um, are there places, uh, links, or literature if there are homeowners and the hobbyists that want to encourage or develop habitat for uh, native bees? Yeah, so habitat for native bees, I think one of the resources I just put up here, the one on the right, has, I know it has a chapter on setting up bee habitat, and it talks about the, the whole process from selecting a site to how you would prepare it in terms of whether you're going to use herbicide or tillage to uh, get the soil ready and then which species of, um, it's not exhaustive, but it has a, a good list of regionally relevant plants that would be good for, um, for supporting pollinators. So that's one, I mean the book is one way to do it, but the website that's listed just underneath, that also has some regionally relevant um, planting guides for um, you know, for the Midwest or the Mid-Atlantic states, whichever region you're from. That's one place to go to. Um, there's a book that I saw in the, um, in the trade show by, I think it's by Heather Horn. It's got kind of a blue cover and some nice photographs of bees on the front. And that's uh, a book about wild bees and, and their relationships with plants. So it's, it, that goes into a little bit more detail on, um, on particular plant species that might be good to put together. The other thing I would say is if you're interested in setting up habitat, there's some great local companies in Michigan. There's a Michigan Native Plant Producers Association. And um, depending on where you are, there's probably a, a local nursery that you could talk to. And those folks usually have a really good sense of what species would go together well and, and a, mix of, um, a mix of plants. So then I'm going to also give you the MSU plug um, since we're here. Um, I think if I can get back, so MSU has this, has this pollinators and pollination page, which is one way that you can get into the program I just talked about that Megan um, is heading up. The other website that's relevant to your question, if I can get the URL up here, uh, okay, so that's nativeplants.msu.edu and in, in here we have a number of resources which are um, like there's a publication for example on attracting beneficial insects with native flowering plants and it has a whole list of species in there that we've tested and we've shown to be quite attractive to native bees. Um, it's not as focused on honeybees as maybe you're interested in so if honeybees is your focus uh, you might need to look a little bit further than, than this resource, but we currently have a project underway in uh, three of our research stations in Michigan where we're evaluating 50 native Michigan wildflower species and looking at both honeybee and wild bee attraction and comparing those to some of the beekeeper picks and trying to see which, you know, which of those work out. But that's going to take a couple of years till we've got the results out of that. So I hope that gives you something to start with anyway and some ideas to have a look. Okay, well thank you very much. Thanks for coming to the session. And uh, if you've got questions, just come down at the front.